show update. And I ask for listener advice on what telescopes to get next or what telescope to get next on episode 309 of the Actual Astronomy Podcast. I'm Chris and joining me is Shane. We are amateur astronomers who love looking up at the nighttime sky. And this podcast is for anybody else who likes going out under the stars. Shane, it was great having dinner with you the other night. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was good to see face to face uh, or get together for a face to face conversation rather than these virtual ones, because I'm not sure if everybody fully realizes, but like when you and I record this, we are on opposite ends of the city and, and right. we, use, we use Zoom essentially to do the recording. And then, uh, you know, there's some other stuff behind the scenes that we do to get this uh, podcast out there. But uh, yeah, it was great to have supper. Um, that was nice. And uh I'm looking forward to today's episode and, and, you know, you are certainly, I think much further ahead in this next telescope, uh, purchase, you know, with the observatory, uh, looming on the horizon for you. But I've also been giving this a lot of thought too, uh, from my perspective, uh, like for my next telescope, I wouldn't mind some larger aperture. And I, I've been, you know, really focused on a six inch Apple refractor, but I'm, I'm starting to move away from that a little bit. So I'm looking forward to this conversation for my purposes as well. Yeah. We uh, we did a bit of a planning session. Going to be talking to some new and and long term guests, and uh, appreciate everybody's kind words of support and those who contribute via Patreon. But speaking of Patreon support, we hope to bring a new type of content. Shane, you sort of demoed for me uh, a new mm-hmm. tool that we've been able to purchase with the uh, Patreon support. Do you want to talk about that briefly before we get into this? Yeah, sure. So you and I have been sort of teasing on on these recordings in the past about doing like a live, well, sort of live, like we would record a live observing session between you and I, or various other field recordings when we're out observing or in grasslands, and then turn that into an episode. And, um, you know, we both have a desire to do this. It's just the the gear that we had was somewhat limiting, like to record in the field and have, you know, good audio quality uh, probably wasn't we we weren't able to do that in the past with the gear we had. So what we did is we bought some wireless microphones uh, that have some noise canceling and some other features that help eliminate wind noise and, and you know, allow you to record in the field. Mm-hmm. So I think we're set up for that now, Chris. Uh, what we really just need to do is, uh, well, hopefully get some warm temperatures so that we can get out and do some longer observing sessions and then give this a try and, and see what we end up with. Yeah, I was uh, pretty impressed. Like we uh, we clipped them on ourselves. We were in a we were at a steakhouse that was far too loud and busy that we thought to do a recording. And my original thought was we should record. And we were in there for like thirty seconds. You were like, "There's no way we can record here." And I agreed. And we just put them on. And thought, ah, we'll see what it sounds like anyway. And we just carried on with our you know very dull conversation. Then according to the <laughs> listeners, and I was shocked when I got home and you sent me the recording. It would have been totally fine. In fact, it was more difficult for us to hear each other than it would have been um, for the device to to play it back to the listeners. So. I'm really excited about this now because it kind of opens up a a few different possibilities, doesn't it? Like we can do all kinds of stuff with this. Yeah, we really can. And, uh, it'll be exciting just to see what we're, what we turn it into. So I'm, I'm hoping that the observing sessions work well, but, you know, going to various astronomy meetups, get togethers, you know, star parties, uh, all sorts of different options, uh, are out there now. And even like, I was thinking about the fact, like one of the things I was thinking about is, You know, now that, you know, everybody's doing a lot more and we're certainly doing a lot more than we were uh, at this time last year. And and certainly, you know, I'm just realizing today's just about the anniversary of of when they declared it as a pandemic. Here we are almost exactly three years later Mm -hmm. today. And and certainly three years ago when we we talked about starting the podcast up again, we weren't doing a whole heck of a lot of anything other than making the podcast. But now that that's changed quite a bit. Exactly. Yeah. Now everybody for the most part is, I would say fairly close to regular life. Um, you know, I think myself anyway, I'm still exercising some caution, but, um, for the most part it's, it's normal operations here. And this is now an option because, you know, there's just, you're, you're having more interactions in person with people, which is great. One thing I was kind of thinking about as we were chatting with Dave towards the end of our conversation there, and uh, you were talking about, you know, having some other plans and that some weekends and that's great. And I was thinking though, um, it might push us into bringing these recording devices out, going out to my dark sky site, which as soon as kind of the snow melts or, or you know, gets off my uh, 
heat pump, I can fire that up, warm the place up. We could go out for, you know, if it looks like it's going to be clear on, uh, on like a Saturday evening or something like that. And we can maybe spend like the afternoon doing a bunch of recordings, record our observing session that night and put a whole pile of uh, recordings sort of in the can. And then uh, we can uh, continue on uh, life as normal and not leave the listeners hanging. Although you might have to, you might have to hide your face because I I don't know if I can tolerate your eye rolling and and shaking your head as I'm talking because I can't see that right now right so. there's none of that that goes on. <laughs> you'll throw me off no, no, not at all never never not at all I'm joking I'm joking but it creates uh, creates a whole new you know set of circumstances that that we can try maybe we can try shooting some videos too if I can get a better video camera all right we spend. Uh, Let's see. Lots of time talking to uh, listeners now and talking with with some guests. We we have a few guests coming up. I think next week we're going to have Jim on, who's a, a longtime listener uh, and a local listener at that, and he's going to come on. and And as a newer observer, Shane, I think he's going to talk about some of the books that he's been reading. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, you and I randomly, or at least irregularly, talk about books that we've purchased recently. Um, but we haven't really done that in a long time. And it sounds like Jim has, you know, kind of gotten into a number of different books and it'd be great to hear his perspective on them. And I'm always interested in different resources. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. I've actually been buying some books on observatories, strangely enough, and can give some people some feedback and and direction on that too. Maybe uh, work that in. Mm-hmm. Um, we just finished chatting with Dave just uh, really a couple minutes ago. A uh, great conversation on the uh, Northern Stars. People should know. I'm uh, super excited to hear what listeners have to think about that. Yeah. Yeah. I love those episodes. Uh, you know, as I stated in that one, I, I learn a lot every time we get together with Dave. You know, he does a lot of research and he's also just in general very knowledgeable about this stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's exciting for me anyway, just to sit back and listen and, and ask the odd question uh, throughout the episode. I, I think one of the things that happened in that episode as well is that, uh, well, Dave and I are, are long term friends and. Yeah, it, uh, I think sometimes it comes through because I know a little bit about his background. So sometimes he'll allude to stuff, and it kind of enables me to dig a little bit deeper on him. Where, where with other people, I you know we might not know as well. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So he's going to come on again in May and talk about the spring stars. You should know, but uh, between now and then, I think we're going to have to try to get him and Kathy LeBlanc on to talk about their Mi'kmaq Moons book and give a copy of that away. Yeah. Yeah. That's exciting too. That's a wonderful book. Uh, We've talked about it a couple of times. I always love learning about indigenous interpretations of the skies. It's just an interesting pastime for me. You know, I, I, I think that all people's interpretations of the skies are interesting. This book in particular, you know, brings a, a perspective that I was unaware of. The artwork is fantastic. The writing is fantastic. It it really is a nice book. And I totally agree with you. I mean, one of the things is, is that here and where we are now, we're on tree four land. And, uh, you know, so we, there, there is that connection between, uh, uh, makes a better connection for us as people who are observing that sky on this land. Absolutely. Another person who's coming on is former national RESC president, uh, Craig Levine. He's not going to come on and talk about the RESC, though. I think he's he's sort of uh, done with that role. But he's an old observing buddy of mine and back from my early days in astronomy. And he is a real gear aficionado. Shane, as long as as long as I've known you, you've you've been into gear a, a bit more than me. But I think Craig is going to have you beat. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you know, I think a lot of our listeners are also interested in gear as well. You know, I think we're all trying to just have the best possible session or the most comfortable session for our observing styles. Uh, so I always find it interesting to hear about what other folks are using and what their opinions are of that gear, because it helps me form my own opinion, whether or not it's something I should consider or just stop thinking about. Yeah, he's Craig's got some interesting gear. Um, he he sells some gear. He mostly is like me and buys gear, except that he buys at a rate that uh, is is eclipsing both you and I combined. And then his brother <laughs> is a real gear aficionado, even more so than Craig, and is getting out of the hobby and is driving up with a U-Haul truck full of equipment. Apparently, whoa, <laughs> this sounds <laughs> amazing. <laughs> Doesn't know exactly what's in there, but some of the smaller items include like a nine and a quarter inch Celestron Schmidt Cassegrain. So that's a bit of a teaser. Mm. Ooh, okay. I'm listening. <laughs> Speaking of other gear, 
This is gonna. This is uh, an episode that's coming up that I'm very excited about. Robert from Analog Sky. People can Google Analog Sky and check out their 3D printed binocular product project that's uh, coming up. He's got a couple of videos out, but hasn't fully released it yet. He's hoping that it is released in the next month, and we're going to have him on in about five or six weeks' time. Yeah, yeah. If anybody uh, is unaware of this project, like like Chris mentioned, go check it out. It's pretty cool. Like I correct me if I'm wrong, Chris. There's some 3D printing in there, but essentially you're you're making or he's making a like a bino telescope, a, a smaller aperture. You know, as a bino viewer myself, I'm very interested in this. It's a bit of a roll your own project, folks. You you um, buy the package. I've, he hasn't said what it costs, but I don't think it costs very much. It's basically like a like a long term subscription, one time fee, and then he gives you the the product list and he's designed. He's done all like whatever they are, CAD drawings or something like that for the three D printing, and uh, you go and get it printed off. Anyway, you'll you'll learn all about that at the end of May or at the end of April. Yeah, yeah, looking forward to that one too. Another one I'm looking forward to, kind of going in a in a different uh, direction, is uh, Howard Vanich from Sky mm. Magazine. He's going to come on and chat to us about really big telescope observing and sketching. Yeah, yeah. Whenever we get kind of the the big aperture guys on here, I love that too. Just the I don't get enough opportunities to look through big apertures, so it's it's fun to talk to folks that do this on the regular and live vicariously through them. 28 inches, I think, is what he's using. For Holy him. smokes. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. On the other side of the spectrum, though, from big telescopes and gear-centered stuff, we're going to have Berta on. She is a uh, astro sketcher, and uh, she does quite a bit of public outreach and observing with uh, like her 10-inch and 4-inch refractor and or tennis reflector and four inch refractor and uh, she's uh an, an observing friend of alistair who we recently had on the show yeah another another person that lives fairly close to us um you know has very similar skies very similar i think observing uh kind of gear and approaches as, as what we have here and that's awesome i'm really looking forward to that conversation too and speaking of Alistair, we're going to have him on in the near future to talk about M51 only. We're going to do an episode solely focused on Messier 51. If people have any observations, sketches, or photographs, please send them along. I already have a few from listeners, including our buddy Mike has contributed an image. I uh, asked Eric for one. I think I have a couple images and another couple sketches from observers already. But yes, please send yours along. We're excited to get them. Yeah, that'll be a neat episode. I don't think we've done one yet, Chris, where we just spend the whole episode talking about one object. So that'll be a, a new thing for us and we'll see how it goes. I think it'll be great. Yeah. So the other night uh, we were chatting, uh, I mentioned I was a little bit flummoxed over perhaps what scope to get next. I recently have acquired an AZEQ6 from a listener. I bought it used in, in really great condition, actually better condition than then new because it's modified for working in our cold weather environment here in Saskatchewan. So I'm super excited to get that out. But with that mount comes along the uh, 20 kilogram carrying capacity, um, which is much more than my current heaviest scope, which weighs in at about seven to eight kilograms fully loaded. So uh, opening up the option for me to have a larger telescope. So Shane, we were discussing this. You said, hey, there's a sort of mini show topic for us. And yeah, I, I think that I think that you had a good idea here, maybe just to make a short episode on this. Yeah, it sort of follows that that you know movie cliche. You know, if you build it, they will come. And I think you the building part is you've got a big mount that can handle a lot of capacity. So now a telescope must come to this mount. Yeah, I'm curious about what the listeners will say and and what the feedback is. So, what are some of the considerations going on here, Chris? Yeah, like you were saying, interested to hear what listeners might send forth. So this setup in many ways is inspired by a, actually a few listeners, Mark Radici, who we've had on the show a few times, and Justin and Wade, um, who I've been communicating with. They all have the uh, AZ EQ6. Wade's is the Saxon version. He's in Australia, so it has to be different down there, I think. For, for Skywatcher anyway. So originally I'd seen uh, Mark Radici set up with his 90 millimeter Megrez refractor and an 11 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain, which he bought used on the other side. And then Wade has an almost identical 
uh, set up down in Australia. And then Justin's is is a little bit different. Actually, it's closer to my setup where he has uh, a four inch Takahashi. And then on the other side, he has the 10 inch Mead ACF, which is, um, according to him, a beautiful planetary telescope. But the pricing on that is uh, is too steep for me, I think, at present. And you don't see them come up used too often. I had been thinking about maybe just trying to pick up an, a, a used 11 inch Schmacassa green. But also, the, the one thing that always popped out to me was the nine and a quarter inch uh, Celestron because. I've often read that there's a little bit of magic in in that focal length, and I've spent some time with that telescope uh, looking at the planets and always thought that that I would have one of those in my future. But then, see, this is where the, this is where like, Shane, there's our observing and kind of our own paths. And then as time has gone on, the podcast has sort of mixed all this up for us, right? It's like a bit of a stew. Yeah, for sure it is, right? There's there's a lot of uh, interactions we've had with listeners that have opened my eyes to different options. Yeah, and so one of the things, of course, that happens is just as we're chatting with people, and uh, one of those people recently has been uh, Alistair Ling, he said, you know, Chris, you're, you're really a wide field observer. He said, I'm not sure the schmidt are going are gonna to work well for you. Just like very clearly seeing through all the noise, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that, you know, if there is a, a downfall with a Cassegrain or a Max Sudov style telescope, well, really it's with any long focal length telescope is you lose that field of view. And I do like the wide field stuff. I think maybe I should be looking at a reflector instead of one of these nine to uh, 11 inch Cassegrains. Because even with a focal reducer, they just get down to F6.3. And with my refractors, I'm I'm using, you know, F5 to F, F7 and a half and used to having like three and a half to as much as 10 degree fields of view with, with my refractors. So perhaps like a 10 or maybe even like a 12 inch reflector as f4 or f4.8 or something like that with a coma corrector maybe maybe that would be a good way to go for sure you know there's there's a lot of options in those telescopes uh you know for shorter focal length you know to give you as much field of view as possible with as much aperture as possible um so i love that idea you know another one too uh, because you're obviously uh with with the AZ or EQ AZ6 whatever that thing is called <laughs> Uh, you're, you're going to run that in AZ mode, confirm that. And, uh, so you're going to have, you know, probably big aperture on one side, probably something a little smaller on the other. Is there any like consideration for that, Chris, you know, like, would, would you consider say the Cassegrain on one side and then on the other side, the ST80 or, or, you know, as a smaller wide field slash rich field telescope? Oh yeah. Like that's what I was thinking is that I like, uh, like Mark had is 11 inch and 90 and, weight is the 10 inch and the uh and the 100 millimeter tack i was thinking that i would put you know sort of alternate out between my uh, borg five inch and the tack the borg five inch and the tack uh, four inch and any of the other small uh refractors or reflectors that i have so i i was kind of thinking about perhaps something like that and then you know shane like you were saying you you've been thinking about scopes as well and you know one of the original things that I thought of was getting a big refractor and probably the uh, AZEQ6 would uh, would be able to hold one of the 8-inch F6 uh, achromatic uh, refractors and, and putting something like that plus the Takahashi on the other side would uh, would be like a match made in heaven. Wow. Did you say 8-inch F6 refractor? Yeah. Yeah, so wow. the uh, the iStar folks used to make mm -hmm. an eight inch f six, and I think you can still order the lens uh, mm -hmm. and get somebody to to build you a tube. Not an inexpensive option, but you know, actually in the same price range as as a Mead ten inch ACF is right, right, working. yeah. Yeah, that would be incredible. The The issue that I'm having a little bit, so I mentioned that I was on the path to a six inch Apo, mm -hmm. um, and now I'm starting to reconsider that, is that you know, these big refractors, even at a faster focal ratio, still typically have a real long tube, you know, very long moment arm, you know, for myself, that would also mean a big upgrade for mount mm -hmm. and uh, starting to consider maybe, you know, like a Max Sutoff that gives you a, a pretty crisp view, but is a much smaller package. So, you know, mounting becomes a, a much easier prospect. And I'm right there with you because like my next line, it's almost as if you've read the notes, uh, <laughs> is, is, which I know you didn't, which is fine, um, which is the uh, Takahashi Mulan 210, yeah. 
which yeah. is even less expensive than either the Mead ACF or uh, or an eight inch F six uh, Acromat. Now, of course, with this telescope, you just have a planetary machine, but you have that Takahashi in that eight inch form factor, um, or even a little bit more with with the uh, Takahashi four inch or Borg five inch on the other side, and you know that would be uh, an incredible dual set, but. I was really hoping to get kind of that 10 inch plus light grasp though. So I feel mm. like this is, this is getting a bit thin almost for, for what I was uh, hoping to achieve. And the, the Takahashi Mulan, what design is that? Cause I don't think it has a corrector, does it? No, or that's am I wrong? Correct. Or that seems like a strange thing to say. That's <laughs> correct. No corrector. Uh, okay. Let me correct myself. The, the <laughs> Mulan is it looks basically like a Schmidt Cassegrain, but it's a little bit longer and there's no corrector plate on the front. It still has that uh, secondary mirror that the light focuses off of, but it just has a primary secondary. And then of course you put your uh, diagonal in, or maybe it has a corrector in inside or in front of that um, secondary. I haven't really looked into this uh, that much yet as, as you can tell, or maybe even something like something really budget friendly, which I could do sooner than later. Um, might be to get one of those eight inch classical Cassegrains that have been out from, uh, you know, various, uh, various branded sources. I've read great reviews of those. They're kind of a little bit big and awkward for non-permanent setups, but at the same time, they don't have a corrector either. And mm-hmm. of course the uh, downside in our environment, uh, with the corrector plate chain is you've created a bubble that's very warm from the daytime heating and our nights get very cool all, all the year. And uh, you can get into some uh, cool down issues when, when you have those Schmidt Casa grains. Yeah. Well, that's been my, I guess, reluctance to consider one in the past um, because I've had uh, two, two times in my life, I've had a five inch Maxutov and, you know, it's a nice telescope, both, both were Skywatcher versions, very nice telescope. Um, I like the form factor. Uh, but what I did not like was the cool down. And I just felt like it was constantly chasing, you know, the environment around me uh, or chasing the temperature around me. And as such, it, it, it just seemed like it never fully acclimated and I, I just got annoyed by it. And that's why I don't have them anymore. Uh, mm-hmm. so these classical Casa grains or the, the TAC Mulan without that corrector sort of helps a little bit, right? You you don't have that bubble of air being trapped. So I'm, I'm intrigued by that for sure. So what, what do people think I should do here and, and maybe other guidance for, for Shane as well? I think Shane should get the six inch apocryphal. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Weigh in, weigh in with your thoughts and considerations for what uh, either Shane or I uh, should do. Shane, uh, you know, is, is eventually going to look at getting a, a larger, more planetary oriented telescope. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a planetary observer. I'm also a, a wide field, deep sky observer. So what what should I do? And yeah, just, just let us know. You can send us an email. You can send that to actualastronomy at gmail.com. We're also looking for your observations, photos, and sketches for an M51 show that we're going to do with Alistair Ling in about uh, two weeks time. Thank you everyone for listening and we hope you enjoyed the show. If you are interested in more information, would like to contact us, or if you would like to support the podcast, check out our website, actualastronomy.com.